Albus Dumbledore on The Wizard and the Hopping Pot. A kind old wizard decides to teach his hard-hearted son a lesson by giving him a taste of the local muggle's misery. A young wizard's conscience awakes and he agrees to use his magic for the benefit of his non-magical neighbours. A simple and heartwarming fable, one might think, in which case it would in which case would reveal oneself to be an innocent nincompoop. A pro-muggle story showing a muggle-loving father as superior in magic to a muggle-hating son? It is nothing short of amazing that any copies of the original version of this tale survived the flames to which they were so often consigned. Beadle was somewhat out of step with his times in preaching me a message of brotherly love for muggles. The persecution of witches and wizards was gathering pace all over Europe in the early 15th century. Many in the magical community felt, and with good reason, that offering to cast a spell on the muggles next door sickly pig was tantamount to volunteering to fetch the firewood for one's own funeral pyre. It is true, of course, that genuine wizards and witches were reasonably adept at escaping the stake, block, and noose. See my comments about Lisette de Lapine on the commentary on Babbitt's Rabbity and her cackling stump. However, a number of deaths did occur. Sir Nicholas de Mimsey Porpington, a wizard at the royal court in his lifetime and in his death time a ghost of Gryffindor Tower, was stripped of his wand before being locked in a dungeon and was unable to magic himself out of his execution. And wizarding families were particularly prone to losing younger members whose inability to control their own magic made them noticeable and vulnerable to muggle witch hunters. Let the muggles manage without us was the cry, as wizards drew further and further apart from their non-magical brethren, culminating with the institution of the International Statute of Wizarding Secrecy in 1689, when wizardkind voluntarily went underground. Children being children, however, the grotesque hopping pot had taken hold of their imaginations. The solution was to jettison the pro-muggle moral but keep the warty cauldron, so by the middle of the 16th century a different version of the tale was widely cir in wide circulation among wizarding families. In the revised story, the hopping pot protects an innocent wizard from his torch-beating, pitchfork-toting neighbours by chasing them away from the wizard cottage, catching them and swallowing them whole. At the end of the story, by which time the pot has consumed most of his neighbours, the wizard gains a promise from the few remaining villagers that he will be left in peace to practice magic. In return, he instructs the pot to render up his victims, who are duly burped out of its depths, slightly mangled. To this day, some wizarding children are only told this revised version of the story by their generally anti-muggle parents, and the original, if and when they are ever read it, comes as a great surprise. As I have already hinted, however, it is, its pro-muggle sentiment was not the only reason that the wizard and the hopping pot attracted anger. As the witch hunts grew ever fiercer, wizarding families began to live double lives, using charms of concealment to protect themselves and their families. By the 17th century, any witch or wizard who chose to fraternise with muggles became suspect, even an outcast in his or her own community. Among the many insults hurled at pro-muggle witches and wizards, such fruity epithets as mud wallower, dung licker, and scum sucker date from this period, was the charge of having weak or inferior magic. Influential wizards of the day, such as Brutus Malfoy, editor of Warlock at War, an anti-muggle periodical, perpetrated the stereotype that a muggle lover was about as magical as a squib. A squib is a person born to mag magical parents but who has no magical powers. Such an occurrence is rare. Muggle-born witches and wizards are much more common. J.K.R. In 1675, Brutus wrote, This we may state with certainty. Any wizard who shows fondness for the society of muggles is of low intelligence, with magic so feeble and pitiful that he can only fe feel himself superior if surrounded by muggle pigmen. Nothing is a surer sign of weak magic than a weakness for non-magical company. This prejudice eventually died out in the face of overwhelming evidence that some of the world's most brilliant wizards, such as myself, were, to use the common phrase, muggle lovers. The final, ob final objection to the wizard and the hopping pot remains alive in certain quarters today. It was summoned up best, perhaps, by Beatrix Bloxham. 1794-1910, author of the infamous Toadstool Tales. 
Mrs. Bloxham believed that the tales of Beadle the Bard were damaging to children because of what she called their unhealthy preoccupation with the most horrid subjects such as disease, death, bloodshed, wicked magic, unwholesome characters, and bodily effusions and eruptions of the most disgusting kind. Miss, Mrs. Bloxham took a variety of old stories, including several of Beadle's, and rewrote them according to her ideals, which she expressed as filling the pure minds of our little angels with healthy, happy thoughts, keeping their sweet slumber free of wicked dreams and protecting the precious flower of their innocence. The final paragraph of Mrs. Bloxham's pure and precious reworking of The Wizard and the Hopping Pot reads, Then the little golden pot danced with delight, hoppity hoppity hop, on its tiny rosy toes. We Willikins had cured all the dollies of their poorly tum-tums, and the little pot was so happy that it filled up with sweets for we Willikins and the dollies. But don't forget to brush your teethy pegs, cried the pot. And we Willikins kissed and hug huggled the hoppity pot, and promised always to help the dollies and never to be a grumpy old, an old grumpy wumpkins again. Mrs. Bloxham's tale has met the same response from generations of wizarding children, uncontrollable retching, followed by an immediate demand to have the book taken from them and mashed into pulp.